Hi, I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall. As we head into the final week of the NFL regular season, I think it's time to evaluate the teams that seem to be headed for the playoffs, Tom. Which do you think uh, is the strongest team in the West? Well, strongest is tough. I think the L.A. Rams are perhaps the best coach team and best prepared right now, but I think the Oakland Raiders are certainly one of the most physical, strong teams if you have to go talent-wise. The thing that shocks me a little bit about the Rams, uh, maybe shocks too strong, but uh, is to watch their defense perform. Boy, they don't make any mistakes. And they put a lot of pressure on you, both uh, throwing and uh, and running the ball. And if you look at their secondary on paper, it doesn't look that good. But the Raiders are tough, too. And the linebackers for the Rams are playing extremely well. What about Denver, though, and Atlanta? Now, they're two teams that, uh, you know, they're very physical, very mean. Uh, the Broncos have come a long way this year. Falcons seem to have lost some of that mean streak in the last couple of weeks. They looked uh, awfully good when they won those seven straight. Denver, uh, John Ralston, I think, has done an outstanding job. They're playing good in all aspects of the game, too. All right, the strongest team then in the entire league, what are you, who do you like overall? Dallas is the best-looking team. I've never seen the Cowboys play that well. We'll see all the teams, though, and all the best action from last week's games. And what about our featured performer of the week, Tom? Well, out west, our featured performers of the week are plural, the ground gainers for the Oakland Raiders, the men that make that ground game go. Number 44 is Marv Hubbard. 6'1", 225, and his fifth year from Colgate. He was the number 11 pick of the Raiders back in 68. Charlie Smith is number 23. He's in his sixth year from Utah, the number four pick in 68, a 205-pounder who looks small. And number 28 is Clarence Davis, 5'10", 195. In his third year from USC, the number four pick in 1971. And he's the big breakaway threat. Of course, up front, there's old double aught Jim Otto at center and Upshaw and Beeler are the guards. The tackles are Bob Brown, who's been hurt quite a bit, Art Shell, and John Vela, who's been playing in place of Brown. Last week, the Raiders ran 61 times for 259 yards against Kansas City. In many ways, this season has been a year for the have-nots in pro football. And two of the teams that have come from obscurity to show signs of a bright future are the New England Patriots and the Buffalo Bills. Up in Orchard Park, New York, the Buffalo Bills and the New England Patriots had a snowy day for football. But these days, a carpet sweeper is all they need to make the mod sod playable. After a New England field goal, number 89, Wallace Francis took the ensuing kickoff and skated coast to coast to make the score 7-3 Buffalo. Then O.J. Simpson took over, showing that like the U.S. mail, nothing, neither rain, nor sleep, nor snow, nor gloom of night can keep him from his appointed round. For the afternoon, O.J. gained 219 yards, leaving him just 60 yards short of Jim Brown's record of 1,863 yards gained in a season. And another 200-yard day in the Bills finale with the New York Jets this week would put him over 2,000 yards for the 1973 season. With O.J. Simpson controlling the football, Buffalo built a 24-6 lead. Then rookie quarterback Joe Ferguson hit number 81, Bob Chandler, for two scores, and Buffalo rolled up 37 points.
Jim Plunkett and the rekindled New England Patriots managed to exhibit their explosive form only once. Number 33, Reggie Rucker, made a nice catch of this Plunkett pass, setting up a six-yard scoring run by Jim Plunkett himself for the Patriots' only touchdown of the day. For the rest of the afternoon, a stingy Bills defense sat on Plunkett and the Patriots as the offense billed a 37-13 victory, leaving the Buffalo Bills with still distant hopes for a wild-card playoff spot approaching the end of their finest season since 1966. The Bills with that eight and five record, Pat, have to be one of the biggest surprises of the year. Certainly can't disagree with that, Tom. And the only team that's ahead of them in the AFC East had an equally big surprise in store when they traveled north to Baltimore last week. The Miami Dolphins were prepared for a cold day in Baltimore, but they certainly were not prepared for the icy reception they got from the Colts. That quarterback in place of Bob Greasy was number 15 Earl Morrill to get some work under game conditions. Marlon Briscoe accounted for the longest play of the game, but he and Earl Morrill could not account for any Miami touchdowns. Baltimore offense was even more unorthodox. Four times the Colts went for it on fourth down and made it. Once on a fake field goal and run by number 11, Jack Mildred. Rookie Bill Oles, number 38, ran 11 times for 50 yards and one touchdown, which gave him a chance to show off some of that good old Nebraska spirit. Another cold score came on another fourth down gamble by Marty Domries, who found tight end Tommy Mitchell for six. The Baltimore offense scored 16 points, their first in almost five games against Miami. Usually 16 points wouldn't be enough against Miami, but the Baltimore defense made it seem like more than enough. Earl Morrill hit on 11 of 23, but the Colts secondary came up with the biggest catches. Number 44, Rex Kern, came up with one big play, and his defensive teammates loved him for it. Another big interception came about when Earl Morrill threw unwisely, and Rick Volk had an easy one. The Colts won 16-3, which snapped their own six-game losing streak, and the Dolphins' 10-game winning streak as well. Lydell Mitchell said after the game, this makes our season. We beat the champs, and that means something. With an earlier win of 40 to nothing over the New Orleans Saints, the San Francisco 49ers perhaps weren't taking those Bayou boys seriously enough as the two teams met in Tulane Stadium last Sunday. Archie Manning officially welcomed back an old friend and teammate as Danny Abramowitz returned to New Orleans, sporting new colors and a new team. The seven-year veteran at wide receiver had taken part in the 49ers' earlier destruction of the Saints. But today, he would witness only revenge from the guys in the white shirts. Number 11, Vivian Lee, grabbed off the only Saint interception as 49er quarterback Steve Spurrier could lead the Big Red to only a field goal in three quarters. However, when second-year man Joe Reed replaced Spurrier in the fourth period, San Francisco did manage to move. A Reed to Ted Qualick hookup netted six points, but it wasn't going to be enough for the 49ers. Number 86, Cedric Hardman, broke in to drop Archie Manning three times for the afternoon. But Archie did manage to overcome the rush long enough to lead the Saints on their only touchdown march.
For the touchdown, Manning isolated Jubilee Dunbar on Bruce Taylor for a 37-yard TD combination. When Manning was injured, Bobby Scott came on to direct New Orleans to three game-deciding field goals and a 16-10 win over the San Francisco 49ers. 1973 signaled the end of competition for the Saints in Tulane Stadium. Next year, the newly constructed Superdome will witness the future fortunes of the vastly improved New Orleans Saints football club. Two weeks ago, the Atlanta Falcons, sporting a seven-game win streak and with their last three games at home, looked to be an odds-on favorite for an NFC playoff spot, Tom. Well, Pat, we all know what happened to the Falcons against the Buffalo Bills, but last Sunday, they committed the monumental error of underestimating their opponent, the St. Louis Cardinals, and they got blown out of the sky once again. Eddie Ray is one of the Atlanta running backs who got such a well-inscribed lesson in underestimation, he may not even remember it. Ray was not the only Falcon to get his feathers ruffled, however, as five times the Cardinals winged in to sack the frustrated Falcon signal callers. Aside from a 32-yard Nick Mickemeyer field goal, the only other points the Falcons could produce came off a 38-yard interception return by number 27, Tom Hayes. But Hayes' performance was the only Atlanta achievement worthy of praise, as for the greater part of the day, the Falcons tried to count the ways to give it away. And have it taken away. Five times the dazed Falcons turned the ball over, and inevitably a fellow named Jim Bakken capitalized on the miscues with field goals. Six times the Cardinal place kicker found his range, and by the end of the afternoon was fifth on the all-time scoring list with 1,002 career points. With Jim Hart injured, the Cardinal air attack was grounded, but even so, the offense gouged out 243 yards rushing. 100 yards of which came off the stylish sprints of rookie sensation Terry Metcalf. With 20 of their 32 points coming through the crossbars, Jim Otis' touchdown was a welcome diversion. And while it seemed that nothing could go right for the Falcons, the Cardinals seemed to be beyond reproach. Indeed, the last play of the game all but confirmed the Cardinal destiny to win as Donnie Anderson's fumble turned from a bungle to a six-point bonus. Number 80, Jim McFarland scooped up the ball and the 32-10 margin of victory broke a four-game St. Louis losing streak and left the Falcons wondering what the heck happened to all their playoff dreams. In Philadelphia, the Eagles' defense prepared for Joe Willie Namath in a barrage of passes. Instead, they got Al Woodall, and their assortment of odd defenses was ill-suited to stop the run. With Joe Namath suffering from a midweek injury, the Jets' game plan was geared to the run. Number one, Mike Adamley rushed for 84 yards, and teammate Emerson Boozer rushed for 160, as the Jets' blueprint for victory worked to perfection. Boozer scored two first period touchdowns. The first resulted from a well-conceived Woodall pass. The second was highlighted by textbook blocking by the Jets' offensive line. Three Philadelphia fumbles tarnished first quarter Eagle drives. The most ruinous was by Harold Carmichael, the NFL's leading receiver.
Bolstered by eagle mistakes in a running game that amassed almost 280 yards, the Jets built a 17-0 lead. But Woodall's gluttony for points got him in trouble when he was intercepted by Randy Logan. With less than two minutes to play in the half, Roman Gabriel general Philadelphia to the Jets, too. With it first and goal, Gabriel crossed up New York and connected with Don Zimmerman for the Eagles' first touchdown. Trailing 17-7, Gabriel opened up the second half with an arrow to Carmichael. Sixty-two yards and a thunderous spike later, Philadelphia was back in the game. Last year, Carmichael rusted on the bench, while teammate Harold Jackson led the league in receiving. When Jackson, along with two number one draft choices, were dealt to the Rams for Gabriel, the elongated game breaker emerged from the shadows. The Eagles' comeback was spurred by cast-off cornerback John Outlaw, who returned a Woodall pass for a touchdown as Philadelphia hung on to notch victory number five, 24-23. Well, both the Redskins and the Cowboys have an abiding dislike for each other, and with a title at stake, the simmering rivalry boiled into a blood feud at Texas Stadium last week, Pat. As Will Rogers once said, Tom, I never met a man I didn't like, but obviously he never met a coach <laughs> on game day. It was not Sonny's adipose tissue that worried George Allen, but the wobbly knees that has curbed his passing mobility. So for the umpteenth straight week, George relied on his back-breaking defense. Early in the first quarter, Roger Staubach unleashed the home run to Bob Hayes. The 50-yard explosion was nullified by a holding penalty. And for most of the first half, Dallas was buried by the Burgundy. Even with maximum protection, Roger was rarely able to penetrate the well-disguised Washington defenses. Three times, the over-the-hill gang put Kurt Knight in range for three-pointers. But all three times, Knight shanked the ball, and at halftime, Washington trailed Dallas three to nothing. In the final two quarters, the aroused doomsday defense canceled out the Redskin offense. They limited Washington to but two first downs, and under this pressure, the Redskins spewed out the football. While Washington weakened, Staubach grew more confident. And bolstered by his pinpoint passing and nimble feet, Dallas scored the game's first touchdown. Using clever play action, Staubach rolled out and exploited the soft underbelly of the Redskins' defense. Behind the blocks of number 70 all-pro tackle Rayfield Wright, Cowboy setbacks roll through gaping holes.
even a missed assignment failed to ruffle Rogers' cool as Dallas was determined to win their vendetta against Washington. By game's end, Calvin Hill had rushed for over 1,000 yards on the season. He gouged out a pair of touchdowns as Dallas won 27-7 and recaptured first place in the NFC East. We'll be right back with the second half of this week in pro football following station identification. Well, probably the division with the most disappointments this year has been the NFC Central, Pat. The Packers, the Lions, and the Bears are all struggling along in the wake of the Minnesota Vikings. It was definitely an anti-climax, Tom, when Don McCafferty's Lions clinched second place last week against Abe Gibran's still struggling Bears. The only pleasant moments for the Bears last week came about when number 60 rookie Wally Chambers caused Mel Farr to fumble, and number 89 Mel Tom put the Bears' offense in scoring position. Seizing this rare opportunity, number 19, rookie quarterback Gary Huff rolled out and hit tight end Bob Parsons for six points. Parsons' touchdown was to be Chicago's only score of the day. The rest of the day was a misery for rookie Huff, who was consistently hounded by the revitalized Detroit rush line. Rough customers like number 82, Ken Sanders, and number 80, Herb Orvis. Watch Orvis, number 80, work up the middle to set up a sack by Larry Hand. Sometimes the steady hand at right end doesn't need any help. Watch number 74 at work. If the Lion front four wasn't bothering Huff, then someone else was. Like number 50, right linebacker Paul Newmall. When Huff had time to throw, he hit on only nine of 27 passes and often found other ways to get into trouble in the Detroit secondary. Number 26 is safety Dick Geron, the rookie from Yale, who intercepted three times in the previous meeting with Huff and the Bears. For the day, the Lions' defense seemed to move the ball better than the Bears' offense which amassed a grand total of just 79 yards. Even their punting game was turned against them. But then Lim Barney can almost make any tackler look foolish. Lynn Barney had shown once again why he is considered one of the most exciting players in the game. Detroit had some offensive performers, too. Number 24, Mel Farr, scored two touchdowns, the first on an easy jaw up the middle, and the second on an instinctive veer to the outside against the drawn-in Chicago defense. Bill Munson, number 19, is finally getting an extended chance at quarterback for Detroit since Greg Landry is unavailable due to the injury. Munson hit 14 of 28, including two touchdown passes, one of them to wide receiver Al Barnes, number 86. Munson's other payoff pass was perfectly thrown to a crossing Ron Jesse, number 89. It was an impressive day for the Lions, a day which enabled coach Don McCafferty to experiment, such as with a backfield combination of Bill Kappelman, 
Mickey Zofko, and number 35, rookie Leon Crosswhite. Resistless, the Lions swept forward and won 40 to seven over the hapless Chicago Bears. Coming off an embarrassing 27 to nothing loss, the Minnesota Vikings were out to regain their image of power as they traveled to the frozen playground of the Green Bay Packers last week, Tom. That's right, Pat. With a wind chill factor of three degrees, the Packer faithful found little to cheer about while witnessing yet another demonstration of putting the pack flat on their backs. There were many who questioned the Vikings championship medal after last week's showing, and perhaps no one was more aware than the team itself. However, the Vikings are an exceptionally strong football team, exploding with power on the defense and offense. And against the Green Bay Packers, they weren't about to suffer another letdown. The only consistent attacking power for the Packers came from number 42, John Brockington. The bull elephant ripped for 124 yards on 27 grueling carries, placing him over the 1,000-yard mark for the third time in three seasons as a pro. Green Bay could score but once, as a 17-yarder from Jim Del Gazo to Barry Smith was all that the big purple defense would allow. The pack found consistent trouble in the person of number 20, cornerback Bobby Bryant. The six-year veteran who once turned down a professional baseball contract to roam the gridiron for the Vikings Picked off three Jerry Taggy aerials, returning one 46 yards for touchdown. Offensively for the Vikes, Fran Tarkenton waved his magical arm to produce two TD strikes, the first going to tight end Stu Voigt. Tarkenton came back with a 20-yard floater to super catcher John Gilliam. Minnesota received a big day from number 44, Chuck Foreman, as the Rookie of the Year candidate posted 100 yards for the afternoon. This one going for 50 yards and a score. With a 31-7 victory over Green Bay, the Vikings will be looking for win number 12 of the season this week against the New York Giants. Last Sunday in Pittsburgh, the Houston Oilers ran into something they don't get much of at home. That would be the elements. They also ran into something they get plenty of, whether home or away. That would be a sound whipping. It was one of those days, rainy, slippery, and full of mistakes and penalties for both Houston and Pittsburgh. The ball took on the aspects of a greased watermelon seed for much of the afternoon. In addition to the fumbles, there were four touchdowns called back, including this one, which was one of three for the Steelers. The last Steeler score, which didn't count, was this punt return by number 41, Dennis Meyer. Dennis registered his disappointment much the same way he would have had the score been good.
As an addendum to all the mistakes, Terry Bradshaw was welcomed back from injury and welcomed rudely by Houston's Joe Blayhot, number 27, who had the longest of the day's eight interceptions. Blayhawks grab and go for 87 yards, set up a Houston lead, which came on an 11-yard Dante Pastorini to number 82, Mac Alston hookup. Bradshaw suffered even more rudeness a little later on, and the Houston Oilers looked like they may have had upset in mind. Then the lights went out, the steel curtain descended, and Dante returned to purgatory. Finally finding the range, Terry zipped the go-ahead score to number 83, Barry Pearson, and the Steelers led 10-7. The lead grew on a three-yard pass from Bradshaw to Steve Davis, which, when added to four Roy Girella field goals, made things dismal for Houston. Dante Pastorini's descent into the seventh circle became complete when he fumbled and Jack Ham recovered for the Steelers to finalize a 33-7 run. With a four-game win streak, the Cincinnati Bengals met the Cleveland Browns last Sunday in a key AFC Central Division battle, Pat. So true, so true, Tom. <laughs> and with six wins and six home outings, the Bengals once again used the home turf advantage to gain an even clearer vision of their playoff destiny. It was a fired-up Cincinnati ball club that welcomed the Browns' invasion, as it was time to see who would represent the AFC Central in the playoffs. Ken Anderson put in a strong bid for the Bengals as he directed his club 58 yards for the opening score, which came on a nine-yard hookup to rookie Isaac Curtis. Anderson used one play on the next Bengal possession to register another six-pointer, this time for 70 yards, and again to Isaac Curtis for a 14 to nothing lead. While the Browns threatened, they could gain but a field goal and found success coming in punishing measures. Ken Anderson again drove Cincinnati close just before the half, sailing the final 20 yards on a dart to Isaac Curtis. Isaac Curtis's third touchdown reception gave Cincinnati a commanding 21-3 lead at half, and the Bengals appeared on their way to the playoffs. But with the start of the second half, it was an aroused Cleveland club that took the fight directly to the Bengals. Billy LaFear's 59-yard return brought the Browns in close, where a short completion from Mike Phipps to Gloucester Richardson produced the needed tally. Cleveland then called on its defense for a big play, and boy, did they respond. Safety Van Green's touchdown on the return fumble swept Cleveland back into the contest, trailing only by seven, 24-17. The Browns have been known as the come-from-behind team in the past few weeks, but the Bengals weren't about to let this one slip away. The 
The attempted Ken Anderson to Charlie Joyner connection got a boost when Clifford Brooks was called for interference. Setting up a one-yard plunge by Booby Clark, salting away the game for the Bengals, 34 to 17. But it was the Cincinnati defense which actually preserved the win. Coming up with one fumble and two key interceptions in the fourth quarter, this one to number 23, Bernard Jackson. With a win over the Houston Oilers this week, Cincinnati will assure themselves of the AFC Central Championship while gaining a shot at the world champion Miami Dolphins in the opening round of the playoffs. Last Saturday in Oakland, the Kansas City Chiefs were knocked out of the 1973 playoff picture. Actually, the way they were treated by the Raiders, knocked out is more of a euphemism than a description of what really happened. The Raiders' hairstyles this year have been about as consistent as their play. But last week, they made the long trek west a misery for some big-button Kansas City Chiefs faithful. The silver and black, led by number 60, Otis Sistrunk, shut the Chiefs' ground game down completely, allowing only 24 yards rushing all day. The Raiders themselves struck through the air early in the first quarter on a Ken Stabler to Fred Blitnikoff score that Fred celebrated with a casual flair that keeps the Raiders Chiefs rivalry boiling. Of course, the game is always a big one and died in the wool Kansas City hater Marv Hubbard rose to the occasion with a 31 yard blast up the middle to easy living. The replay shows that once through the line, Marv went unmolested and Oakland led 14 to nothing. Stopped on the ground, Mike Livingston took his team up top where he was intercepted out of bounds by the man who watched the pyramids being built and who added three field goals himself to Oakland's cause. Yes, it was George Blanda who does it all. Mike Livingston did a little himself as he found a way through the Raiders' tough defense. His 17-yard run was nice, but didn't quite put the Chiefs back in it as they trailed 23 to seven. Livingston's luck didn't last long. Number 43, George Atkinson intercepted one pass, which eventually led to an increase in Oakland's lead. The increase came on a 10-yard outside run by Charlie Smith. It looked like the Raiders had once again pounded the Chiefs out of the playoffs. Trying desperately to get back in it, Pete Bethard kept the Chiefs in the air and ran into number 48 in Amaya Wilson's wraith-like steal. Then the proud and poised Oakland Raiders administered the coup de grace as Kenny Stabler hit Cliff Branch and the Silver and Black had a big win, 37 to seven. Well, old chief, there's always next year. With the Raiders beating the Chiefs, everything is set for this week's showdown between the Oakland Raiders and the Denver Broncos for the championship of the AFC West. Well, Pat, that's a mouthful for a team like the Broncos, who never have had a winning record before this season. But in order for that scenario to take place, the Broncos had to defeat a team last Sunday, which has a championship title of its own. While the Chargers have been subject to a large degree of ridicule in response to their expansive offensive repertoire, 
Last week, the critics were momentarily silenced when the key to the triple option pass was finally discovered. And when you get a man to block for you like that, you treat him with nothing but respect. But the Chargers have a lot to learn about a thing called excess, and it's been their undoing all fall. Despite their 2-9-1 record coming into last Sunday's game with Denver, the Chargers have no lack of individual talent. Number 48, Ron Smith, is one of the NFL's premier return men, as seen on this 70-yard kickoff boat. Rookie quarterback Dan Fouts had himself a 254-yard passing day and registered two TDs, one to sure-handed Gary Garrison. Garrison's grab made the score close at 17-14 in favor of Denver. One of the reasons for that competitiveness was the mobile hulk of rampaging number 38, Robert Holmes. The conclusion to San Diego's 28-point offensive burst was a 69-yard hookup between number 14, Dan Fouts, and number 25, Jerry the Jet Levias. In spite of their spectacular individual efforts and sleight-of-hand offense, the Chargers were no match for Denver's sky-high defense. And with their first winning season ever on the line, the Denverites were nothing short of downright ornery. Their dogged defense even registered two points of their own on this blocked Dennis Partee punt, which rolled out of the end zone. And while the defense was holding its own, Denver's rushing offense was sparked by the inimitable Floyd Little. But the man most responsible for the Broncos' conference-leading offense is quarterback Charlie Johnson, who, although frequently walking wounded, pitched for 215 yards and two TDs against the Chargers. When you have a six foot four inch, 230 pound tight end like number 88, Riley Odoms, who can catch and run, you can bet that doesn't hurt an offense either. And for real power running, number 33, Joe Dawkins is one Bronco who's considered unbustable. The high riding Broncos finished off their 42-28 conquest of the Chargers with a Johnson Zinger, to number 25, Haven Moses, thereby confirming a showdown with the Oakland Raiders this Sunday for all the marbles in the AFC West. Prediction time, and it's goal line defense for me. I'm really running out of time and everything. You're one of those guys who likes to come from behind, though, aren't you? I certainly hope so. Your record is 38 and 35, mine is 45 and 28, so you gotta get going. I'm behind, all right. How about New Orleans at Atlanta? I don't think the Saints will ever forget the beating they got from the Falcons on opening Sunday, 62 to seven, so I'm gonna pick New Orleans in an upset. I'm gonna pick the Atlanta Falcons because the Dutchman won't let it happen any other way, I think. <laughs> Cleveland's at Los Angeles. Oh boy, there's a tough one. The Rams will have it all wrapped up, but they play well anyway. I think the Browns are still hoping, at least uh, for not this year, maybe for next year. I'm going to pick the Browns. Well, because this game is in Los Angeles, they could know. They'll know what happened to Pittsburgh. Right. They'll know what happened to Cincinnati. It could be all over, regardless of, of what happens to the other two teams. Though I like Los Angeles. Chuck Knox has done some job. Sure has. Then, of course, the big one, Denver, is at Oakland. I think at Oakland says a lot. I believe the Raiders are tough anyway, but playing at home for a game that means the whole division, I'm going to go with the Raiders. The Raiders are pretty healthy, too, as I understand. Uh, Charlie Johnson's had a great year. John Ralston's done a good job in Denver, but I agree with you. I like Oakland, too. Okay. At any rate, we'll be back next week to show you what happens and to preview that playoff picture. I'm Pat Summerall. I'm Tom Brookshire, and we'll see you next week. Brought to you by West Clocks, a division of General Time, a tally industries company. Promotional consideration provided by Best Western Motels. 
There are over 1,250 Best Western motels located in more than 900 cities throughout the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And by American Airlines, if the sun is shining there, chances are American flies there. From the Caribbean to California to the South Pacific, American Airlines to the good life. Program materials for this week in pro football travel via REA Air Express.